September 17, 1905, Volume 6, How One Can Participate in the Sorrows of the Queen Mama. Having been in much suffering because of the privation of my most sweet Jesus, this morning, the day of the sorrows of Mary Most Holy, after I struggled in some way, he came and told me, My daughter, what do you want that you so much yearn for me? And I, Lord, what do you have for yourself? That is what I yearn for myself. And he, my daughter, for myself I have thorns, nails, and cross. And I, well, then that is what I want for myself. So he gave me his crown of thorns and shared with me the pains of the cross. Then he added, Everyone can share in the merits and in the goods produced by the sorrows of my mother. One who, in advance, places herself in the hands of Providence, offering herself to suffer any kinds of pains, miseries, illnesses, calumnies, and everything which the Lord will dispose upon her, comes to participate in the first sorrow of the prophecy of Simeon. One who actually finds herself amid sufferings and is resigned, clings more tightly to me and does not offend me. It is as if she were saving me from the hands of Herod, keeping me safe and sound within the Egypt of her heart, and she participates in the second sorrow. One who feels downhearted, dry, and deprived of my presence, and remains yet firm and faithful to her usual practices, even more she takes the opportunity to love me and to search for me more, without tiring, comes to participate in the merits and goods which my mother acquired when I was lost. One who, in any circumstance she encounters, especially in seeing me gravely offended, despised, trampled upon, tries to repair me, to compassionate me, and to pray for the very ones who offend me, it is as if I encountered in that soul my own mother, who, if she could have done it, would have freed me from my enemies. And she participates in the fourth sorrow. One who crucifies her senses for love of my crucifixion and tries to copy the virtues of my crucifixion within herself participates in the fifth one. One who is in a continuous attitude of adoring, of kissing my wounds, of repairing, of thanking, and so forth, in the name of all mankind, it is as if she were holding me in her arms just as my mother held me when I was deposed from the cross, and she participates in the sixth sorrow. One who remains in my grace and corresponds to it, giving a place to no one else but me within her heart. It is as if she buried me in the center of her heart, and she participates in the seventh one. September 7, 1924 Volume 17. How one who does the divine will is wounded by God and wounds God. I was thinking about the holy divine will, and I was doing as much as I could in order to fuse myself in it, to be able to embrace all and to bring to my God as one single act the acts of all, which are all due to our Creator. Now, while I was doing this, I saw the heavens open and a sun come out of them which, wounding me with its rays, penetrated into the very depth of my soul. And my soul, wounded by those rays, turned into a sun which, spreading its rays, wounded that sun from which it had been wounded. And since I continued to do my acts for all in the divine will, these acts were overwhelmed by these rays and transformed into divine acts which spreading through all and over all, formed a net of light, such as to put order between creator and creature. I remained enchanted at this sight, and my adorable Jesus coming out from within my interior, in the middle of the sun, told me, 
My daughter, do you see how beautiful is the son of my will? What power, what marvel. As soon as the soul wants to fuse herself in it to embrace all, my will turning into sun wounds the soul and forms another sun within her. And as she forms her acts, these become rays which wound the sun of the supreme will. And overwhelming all within this light, she loves, glorifies, satisfies her creator for all, and what is more, not with human love, glory, and satisfaction, but with love and glory of divine will, because the son of my will has worked in her. Do you see what it means to do acts in my will? This is to live in my will, the son of my will, transforming the human will into sun, acts in it as if in its own center. Afterwards, my sweet Jesus gathered all the books written by me on his divine will. He united them together, then he pressed them to his heart, and with unspeakable tenderness added, I bless these writings from the heart. I bless every word. I bless the effects and the value they contain. These writings are part of myself. Then he called the angels, who prostrated themselves, their faces to the ground, to pray. And since two fathers, who were to see the writings, were there present, Jesus told the angels to touch their foreheads, to impress in them the Holy Spirit, so as to infuse in them the light, in order to make them understand the truths and the good contained in these writings. The angels did that, and Jesus, blessing us all, disappeared. September 17, 1926, Volume 20 How Each Thing Created by God Has Its Place and one who goes out of the divine will loses his place. Importance of the Kingdom of the Divine Fiat My Jesus, I invoke your holy will, that it itself may come to write on paper the most penetrating and eloquent words, the most fitting terms, to make itself comprehended, in such a way as to portray the Kingdom of the Supreme Fiat with the most beautiful colors, with the most refulgent light, with the most attractive characteristic, so as to infuse a magnetic force and a powerful magnet in the words that you will make me write, such that no one will be able to resist letting himself be dominated by your most holy will. And you, my mamma, true sovereign queen of the supreme fiat, do not leave me alone. Come to guide my hand. Give me the flame of your maternal heart. And while I write, keep me under your azure mantle, that I may fulfill all that my beloved Jesus wants of me. I felt all invested by the supreme volition, that drawing me into its immense light made me see the order of creation how each thing remained at the place assigned by its creator. My mind wandered and was enraptured at seeing the order, the harmony, the magnificence, the beauty of the whole creation. And my sweet Jesus who was with me told me, my daughter, everything that came out of our creative hands, each created thing was assigned its place and its distinct office and all of them remain at their place, magnifying with incessant praises that eternal fiat that dominates them, preserves them, and gives them new life. So they're preserving themselves ever beautiful, whole, and new, is the motion of the supreme fiat dominating in them. Man also was assigned his place, his office of sovereign over all created things, with the difference that while all other things created by us remain just as God had created them, without ever changing, neither increasing nor decreasing, my will, giving man supremacy over all the works of our hands, 
and wanting to show off even more with him in love, gave him the office to grow continuously in beauty, in sanctity, in wisdom, in richness, to the point of raising him to the likeness of his creator. Always provided, however, that he would let himself be dominated and guided, to give the supreme fiat free field in order to form its divine life in him, so as to be able to form this continuous growth of goods and of beauty with happiness without end. In fact, without my will dominating, there can be neither growth, nor beauty, nor happiness, nor order, nor harmony. Since my will is origin, master, and beginning of the whole work of creation, wherever it reigns, it has the virtue of preserving its work beautiful, just as it issued it. But where it does not exist, the communication of its vital humors, in order to preserve the work that came out of our hands, is missing. Do you see, then, what great evil it was for man to withdraw from my will? So all things, even the smallest ones, have their place. It can be said that they are in their home, secure, and no one can touch them. They possess abundance of goods, because that will that flows in them possesses the source of all goods. They are all in the order, the harmony, and the peace of all. On the other hand, by withdrawing from our will, man lost his place. He remained without our home, exposed to dangers. All can touch him to harm him. The very elements are superior to him because they possess a supreme will while he possesses a degraded human will that can give him nothing but miseries, weaknesses, and passions. And because he lost his origin, his place, he remained without order, disharmonized from all, and he enjoys no peace, not even within himself. So it can be said that he is the only being wandering in the whole creation to whom nothing is due by right, because we give everything to one who lives in our will, for he is in our home. He is one from our family. The relations, the bonds of sonship that he possesses by living in it, give him the right to all our goods. On the other hand, one who does not live of the life of my will has broken, as though all at once, all the bonds, all the relations. Therefore he is held by us as something that does not belong to us. Oh, if all knew what it means to break up with our will, and into what abyss they fall, all would tremble with fright, and would compete in order to return into the kingdom of the eternal fiat, to take their place again, assigned to them by God. Now, my daughter, since my eternal goodness wants to give my kingdom of the supreme fiat once again, after man had so ungratefully rejected it, don't you think that this is the greatest gift I can give to the human generations? But in order to give it, I must form it, constitute it, and make known what up to now is not known about my will, and such knowledge is about it as to win those who will know them to love, appreciate, and desire to come and live in it. The knowledges will be the chains, but not imposed. Rather, they themselves willingly will let themselves be bound. The knowledges will be the weapons, the conquering arrows that will conquer the new children of the Supreme Fiat. But do you know what these knowledges possess? The changing of one's nature into virtue, into good, into my will in such a way that they will possess them as their own property. On hearing this I said, My love, Jesus, if these knowledges on your adorable will contain so much virtue, why did you not manifest them to Adam, so that by making them known to posterity, they would have loved and appreciated more a good so great? And this would have disposed the hearts for the time when you, 
divine repairer, would decree to give us this great gift of the kingdom of the supreme fiat. And Jesus, resuming his speaking, added, My daughter, as long as he remained in the terrestrial Eden, living in the kingdom of the supreme will, Adam knew all the knowledges, as much as it is possible for a creature, of what belonged to the kingdom he possessed. But as soon as he went out of it, his intellect was obscured. He lost the light of his kingdom and could not find the fitting words in order to manifest the knowledges he had acquired on the supreme will, because that very divine volition that would hand to him the necessary terms to manifest to others what he had known was missing in him. This on his part, more so since every time he remembered his withdrawal from my will and the highest good that he had lost, he felt such a grip of sorrow as to become taciturn, engrossed in the sorrow of the loss of a kingdom so great, and of the irreparable evils that, as much as Adam might do, it was not given to him to repair. Indeed, that very God whom he had offended was needed in order to remedy them. On the part of his Creator, he received no order, and therefore he was not given enough capacity to manifest it. Why manifest a knowledge if it would not give him the good it contained? I only make a good known when I want to give it. However, even though Adam did not speak extensively about the kingdom of my will, he taught many important things on what regarded it, so much so that during the first times of the history of the world, up to Noah, the generations had no needs of laws, nor were there idolatries no diversity of languages, but all recognized their one God, one single language, because they cared more about my will. But as they kept moving away from it, idolatries arose and degenerated into worse evils. And this is why God saw the necessity of giving his laws as a preserver for the human generations. So one who does my will has no need of laws, because my will is life, is law, is everything for man. The importance of the kingdom of the supreme fiat is immense, and I love it so much that I am doing more than in a new creation and redemption. In fact, in creation, my omnipotent fiat was pronounced only six times in order to dispose it and issue it, all ordered. In redemption I spoke, but since I did not speak about the kingdom of my will, that contains infinite knowledges and immense goods, I did not have a very extensive subject with many words to say, because everything I taught was of limited nature, and a few words were enough to make it known. But in order to make my will known, it takes much, my daughter, its history is extremely long. It encloses an eternity with no beginning and no end. Therefore, as much as I speak, I have always something to say. This is why I am saying, oh, how much more. Being more important than anything, it contains more knowledges, more light, more greatness, more prodigies. Therefore, more words are needed more so since the more I make known, the more I expand the boundaries of my kingdom to be given to the children who will possess it. Therefore, everything I manifest about my will is a new creation that I make in my kingdom, to be enjoyed and possessed by those who will have the good of knowing it. And so, great attention is required on your part in manifesting them. September 17, 1927, Volume 23. The pains are like iron beaten by the hammer that emits sparks. Differences between the cross of the humanity of our Lord and that of the divine will, and how the divine will has its incessant act. My Jesus, life of my poor heart, come to sustain my weakness. 
I am still a little child, and I feel the extreme need for you to keep me in your arms, to guide my hand while I write, to feed me the words, to give me your thoughts, your light, your love, and your very will. And if you do not do it, I will remain here like a fussy little girl doing nothing. If you love so much to make your most holy will known, you will be the first in the sacrifice. I will be in the secondary order. Therefore, my love, transform me into yourself. Take away from me the torpor I feel, for I can bear no more. And I will continue to fulfill your holy will, even at the cost of my life. So continuing in my abandonment in the divine will, I felt myself in the nightmare of the pains. And my beloved Jesus, clasping me to himself to give me strength, told me, My daughter, the pains are like iron, beaten by the hammer, that makes it sparkle with light and become red hot to the point of being transformed into fire, and under the blows it receives, it loses its hardness, it softens, in such a way that one can give it the shape one wants. Such is the soul under the blows of pain. She loses hardness, she sparkles with light, she is transformed into my love and becomes fire, and I, Divine Artificer, finding her soft, give her the shape I want. Oh, how I delight in making her beautiful. I am a jealous Artificer, and I want the boast that no one can and knows how to make my statues, my vases, both in their form and in their beauty, and even more in their fineness, and in the light that sparkling converts them all into truth. So for each blow I give her, I prepare a truth to be manifested, because each blow is a spark that the soul emits from herself, and I do not lose them as does the smith in beating the iron, but I use them to invest those sparks of light with surprising truth, such as to serve the soul as the most beautiful clothing and to administer to her the nourishment of divine life. After this I followed my sweet Jesus, but he was so afflicted and in suffering as to arouse pity. And I, tell me, my love, what's wrong? Why do you suffer so much? And Jesus added, My daughter, I suffer because of the great sorrow of my will. My humanity suffered, it had its cross, but its life on earth was short. On the other hand, the life of my will in the midst of creatures is long. It has been already six thousand years and will last even longer. And do you know who its continuous cross is? The human will. Each act of it opposed to my will and each act of my will that it does not receive is a cross that it forms for my eternal volition. Therefore, its crosses are innumerable. If you look at all creation, you will find it all full of crosses formed by the human will. Look at the sun. My divine will brings its light to creatures, and they take its light, but do not recognize who he is that brings this light and my will receives so many crosses in the sun for as many as are those who do not recognize it, who while they enjoy the light, use that very light to offend that divine will that illumines them. Oh, how hard and painful it is to do good and not to be recognized. The wind is full of crosses. Each of its blows is a good that it brings to creatures. And they take and enjoy that good, but do not recognize who he is that in the wind caresses them, refreshes them, purifies the air for them. And so it feels itself being thrust with nails of ingratitude and crosses at each blow of the wind. The water, the sea, 
the earth, are full of crosses formed by the human will. Who does not avail himself of water, of the sea, of the earth? Everyone does, and yet my will that preserves everything and is primary life of all created things is not recognized and is present in them only to receive crosses from the human ingratitude. Therefore the crosses of my will are numberless and more painful than those of my humanity, more so since my humanity does not lack some good souls who have comprehended its sorrow, its torments, the pains that they made me suffer, and even my death, compassionating me and repairing for what I suffered in my mortal life. On the other hand, those of my divine fiat are crosses that are not known, and therefore without compassion and without reparation. This is why the sorrow that my divine will feels in all creation is so great as to cause now the earth, now the sea, now the wind to burst with sorrow. And in its sorrow, it unloads scourges of destruction. This is the extreme sorrow of my will that unable to endure any more strikes those who do not recognize it. This is why I call you so very often to go around in all creation, to make known to you what my will does in it, the sorrow and the crosses it receives from creatures, so that you may recognize it in each created thing, love it, adore it, thank it, and be the first repairer and consoler of a will so holy. In fact, only one who lives in it can penetrate into its acts and recognize its sorrows, and with its very power, become the defender and the consoler of my will, that for many centuries has been living isolated and crucified in the midst of the human family. Now, while Jesus was saying this, I looked at the creation, and I saw it as all full of crosses that could not be counted, so many there were. And as the divine will would issue its acts from itself to give them to creatures, the human will would issue its cross to crucify those divine acts. What sorrow! What pain! And my beloved Jesus added, My daughter, my eternal fiat has had an incessant act toward creatures from the moment it created the whole creation. But because my reigning will was missing in creatures, these acts were not received by them, and therefore remain suspended in the whole creation within my very divine will. Now when I came upon earth, my first interest was to take into myself its incessant act that had remained suspended within it because it had not been able to take its place in the creature. And my humanity, united to the word, first was to give place to this incessant act, giving satisfaction to it. And this was my unknown passion, the longest and most painful. And then I occupied myself with the redemption. The first act in the creature is the will. All other acts, whether bad or good, are in the secondary order. Therefore, I had to have, as first, the concern of placing in safety within myself all the acts of my divine will, descending down below to the human acts, to reunite the two wills together, so that in seeing its acts being placed in safety, my will might reconcile with creatures. Now today, I invite you to take into yourself these acts rejected by creatures, because my will continues its incessant act and remains with the sorrow of seeing it suspended within itself, for it finds neither anyone who receives them, nor anyone who wants them, nor anyone who knows them. Therefore, be attentive in working and suffering together with me for the triumph of the kingdom of my divine will. 
September 17, 1933, Volume 32, How the Divine Will is the Engine and Assailant. It gives life, it recalls to life, and it makes rise the memory of everything. Divine Encampment how the motion of my divine will forms its life in the creature. I am under the eternal waves of the divine volition, and it seems to me that it wants me to pay attention to these waves, recognize them, receive them in me, and love them in order to say to me, I am the eternal volition. I remain over you. I surround you everywhere. I invest your motion, your breath, your heartbeat, in order to make them mine, and in order to make the way for me, and so be able to extend my life in you. I am the immense one who wants to restrict myself in the human littleness. I am the powerful one who delights in forming my life in the created weakness. I am the holy one who wants to sanctify everything. Pay attention to me and you will see what I know how to do and what I will do in your soul. But while my mind was all occupied by the divine volition, my always lovable Jesus, repeating his brief little visit, told me, My blessed daughter, my will is the engine that, with iron constancy, assails the creature from all sides, inside and outside in order to have her for itself, and to form the great prodigy of forming its divine life in the creature. It can be said that it had created her in order to form and repeat its life in her, and at whatever cost it wants to have its intent. And it goes around her, in all things, and it seems that it says to her, Look at me, it is I, know me. I come in order to form my life in you. And acting as assailant, it assails her inside and out, in a way that one who pays attention feels my divine will regurgitate inside and outside of herself, that forms the prodigy of its divine life, in which it is not given to them to resist its power. And do you know what my divine will does? It gives life. It recalls everything to life. It makes rise in this life everything that it has done for the good of all creatures. It rouses the sweet memory of its works, as present and in act, as if it were repeating them. Nothing escapes from this life. She feels the fullness of everything, and oh, how the creature feels happy, rich, powerful, holy. She feels the trousseau of all the good acts of the others, and she loves for everyone. She glorifies the divine fiat as if they, the good acts of others, were hers. And my volition feels its works being re-given by her, therefore the love, the glory of its divine works, and by the remembrance, the glory and the love of the other creatures being repeated. Oh, how many works are placed in oblivion, how many sacrifices, how many heroic acts that have been done by the human generations, forgotten, that are not thought about any more. And so there is neither the continuous repetition of glory, nor one who renews the love of those acts. And my divine will, forming its life in the human littleness, makes the memory of everything rise in order to give and to receive everything. It accentuates everything in her and forms its divine encampment. Therefore, be attentive to receive these waves of my volition. They re-pour themselves over you in order to change your lot. And if you receive them, you will be its fortunate creature. After this, I continued to think about the divine volition, and I thought to myself, but how can this divine life form in the soul? And my sweet Jesus added, my daughter, 
The human life is composed of soul, of body, of members distinct from one another. But what is the primary motion of this life? The will, such that without it she would not be able to do beautiful works, nor acquire sciences, nor be capable of teaching them, because all the beauty of life would disappear for the creature. And if she possesses beauty, dowry, value, talent, it must be attributed to the motion of order that the will holds over human life. Now, if my divine will takes this motion of order over the creature, it forms divine life within her such that, provided that the creature submits herself to receiving the motion of the order of my will, inside and outside of herself, as prime motion of all her acts, Already this divine life of mine is formed, and it takes its royal palace in the depth of the soul. Motion says life, and if the motion has a human will as beginning, one can call it human life. If instead the beginning is of my will, one can call it divine life. Do you see how easy it is to form this life, provided the creature wants it? I do not want, nor do I ever ask, impossible things from the creature. Rather, first I make it easy. I render it suitable, feasible, and then I ask her. And while I ask her, in order to be more secure that she can do what I want, I offer myself to do together with her what I want her to do. I can say that I place myself at her disposal so that she would find strength, light, grace, sanctity, not human, but divine. I do not heed either what I give or what I do. When the creature does what I want, I abound with her so much as to make her feel not the weight, but the happiness of the sacrifice that my divine will knows how to give. And since human life has its life, its distinct members, its qualities, so our Supreme Being has its most pure qualities, not material, because there does not exist in us matter that forms our life. United together, sanctity, power, love, light, goodness, wisdom, all-seeingness of everything, immensity, and so forth, form our divine life. But who establishes the motion? Who rules? Who develops with an incessant and eternal motion all our divine qualities? Our will. It is the engine, the director, that gives operating life to each of our qualities, such that if it were not for our will, our power would be without exercise, our love without love, and so on with all the rest. See, therefore, how everything is in the will, and therefore by giving it to the creature, we give everything. And since they are our little images created by us, our breaths, the little tiny flames of love dispersed by us and all the created, this is why we gave them a free will united to ours, in order to form our likeness wanted by us. There is nothing that glorifies us more, that loves us more, that renders us more content than finding our life, our image, our will in our work created by us. Therefore we entrust everything to the power of our fiat in order to obtain this intent. My daughter, you must know that as much in our divinity in the supernatural order as in the natural order of creatures, there is a virtue by nature, an innate prerogative of wanting to produce life, images that are similar to it, and therefore a yearning of love, an ardent desire to re-pour oneself into the life and work that one produces. In all creation, there is nothing that is not similar to us. The sky resembles us in immensity, 
the stars in the multiplicity of our joys and infinite beatitudes. In the sun, there is the likeness of our light. In the air, the likeness of our life that gives itself to everyone. It is for everyone, and no one can flee it except if they wanted to. In the wind, that while it makes itself felt, now with forcefulness, now with sweetly caressing the creatures and all things, but they do not see it, just like our power and all seeingness, that we see everything, we hear everything, and we enclose everything as in our fist, but they do not see us. In some there is nothing that is not a similitude of ours. All our works give of us, they praise us, and each one has the office of making known its quality of their creator. Now in man there was not only work that we made, but human life and divine life that we created in him. Therefore we long for, we desire, we yearn to reproduce in him our life and image. We even reach to drowning him with love. And when he does not let himself be drowned, because he himself is free, we reach to persecuting him with love, not letting him find peace in everything that escapes from us. Not finding ourselves in him, we wage incessant war, because we want our beautiful image, our life reproduced in him. And since all things are made and grafted by us, even in the natural order, there is this virtue of wanting to produce similar things and life. Do you see, a mother generates a child. All her anxieties and desires are that she wants him similar to herself, and she yearns to see him in the light, similar to his parents. And if the child is similar to them, oh, how content they are by it. They boast. They want everyone to see him. They raise him with their customs, according to their ways. In sum, this child becomes their preoccupation and their glory. But if instead he is dissimilar to the parents, ugly, deformed, oh, how they remain embittered, tormented, they arrive at saying with greatest sorrow, it seems that he is not our son of our blood. They would almost want to hide him and not let anyone see him, feeling themselves humiliated and confused. And this baby will be the torture of the parents for their whole lives. All things possess the virtue of reproducing similar things. The seed produces another seed, the flower another flower, the bird another little bird, and so for all the rest. Not to produce similar things is to go against the divine and human nature. Therefore not having the creature similar to us is one of our greatest sorrows, and only one who lives of our will will be able to be our joy and bearer of glory and triumph for our creative work. End of September 17th Fiat 